Okay, morning. <coughs> okay, so let's let's use uh, an example here uh, to go over the concept that we have learned in terms of tension joints. All right, so, uh, yeah, please choir down. Uh, this example I'm going to go over, okay? Uh, the uh, the example itself, there, you, you got to be careful basically, sometimes some information you don't need, some information uh, you need, okay? So if you read this, this example right here, you know, for example, it tells you basically uh, the dimension basically has a dimension of the pressure vessel A, B, C, D, and E, which is the members is being clamped. Uh, so the, the the top layer is uh, uh, what's the top layer? It's a st uh, the top layer is a steel, and then the bottom the gray part is uh, cast iron, right? And it, and it, it tells you A, B, C dimensions, okay? Uh, but actually, you probably don't need the dimension here. But it does tell you one important one here. Uh, where is that? Uh, here, the effective ceiling diameter is 150 millimeter. Okay, so that's actually the part that you're going to use at here for this question, because uh, you're going to need to calculate the pressure and then calculate the force. Okay, or the load, external load. Okay, so I'll write down some of the key information in it here. Okay, so D equal to E in this question equal to 20 millimeter. So you can just draw two members at that, okay? And the, the bot, okay, the bot is a, uh, it's a ISO 5.8, okay, with a major diameter D equal to 12 millimeter. So that's the nature, because you need this information to look up the table, okay? And then there is that piece of information saying, okay, effective okay, ceiling diameter, okay, 150 millimeter. Okay, yeah. Is that that darker gray, those two on either side, the darker gray spots? Hmm? You mean this one? Yeah. You just inside of the this one effective ceiling well it, it's actually it should be a mean you know between this CBA's dimensions yeah mm. I'm not sure how it's calculated but I think it should be mean value because because in this question A says it's 100 B is 200 and C is 300 so so I think it's probably you're right it's probably referred to to this one yeah this part is the seal, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, and then uh, there is a static pressure. Six megapound. Okay. Okay. So those information are enough now for us to use. And there are ten bolts. And we need a non-permanent joint. So when you read the uh, the the if particularly in the exam setting, okay, when you read the question, you're looking for those keywords, okay? Yeah, because sometimes uh, I put all of uh, you know gibberish in the question. I'm trying just trying to fit fool <laughs> trying to fool you. So you need to look for the keywords here, okay? Because you need the keywords to to calculate. All right, so. We're going to basically calculate the two safety factors for static one. We're going to calculate uh, one is the load factor, NL, and the other is the separation factor. Okay, let's call it A naught. Okay. So this is a typically a, a very big question. Uh, but I'll, I'm, I'm going to skip, actually, I think it's taken from our assignments here. 
Uh, the process of this kind of question involves uh, three major steps. Step number one, you need to calculate the bolt stiffness. Step number two, you need to calculate the member stiffness. Okay? And then step number three is for the uh, safety factors that I listed over there. Okay, so three major steps for this kind of question, right? So I'll uh, I'll skip a few uh, details that are here, particularly for the bolt stiffness, the member stiffness, right? They uh, they involve uh, uh, basically the knowledge that we learned from previous uh, previous lectures. Okay, but first, okay. Uh, what we need to do is, okay, we need to figure out uh, what is the external tensile load per bolt. Okay, so P, let's see what's the external load, okay, per bolt. So the question didn't tell us it, uh, right away. We need to calculate this one here, okay? So the area of the ceiling, A, We use that 150, okay? So it's pi d squared over 4. So it's pi 150 millimeters squared over 4, okay? That's the area for sitting. Okay. So you calculate this one here. Okay, now I don't have a number here, but we'll leave it as it is, okay? So this is a millimeter square, okay? Yeah. We do have a total pressure inside. The total, the total one is 6 megapound. Uh, we have how many bolts? We have uh, 10 bolts, right? So we're looking for the uh, the we we're looking for the t uh, f yeah. This is th this is the pressure. So first we need to get uh, the total load, uh, the total force, and force over the area give the pressure. So then this F total right equal to what? This P total times a. Okay? So that's the total force. So basically 6, you, you can use the 6 set here. You don't need to change actually, do you need to change here? Okay, so you need to change a little bit in terms of the unit, so be careful there. So 6 times pi times 150 millimeter uh, square divided by 4 and then I'll change that to kilonewton. Okay? So basically times 10 to the power of negative 3 give me a kilonewton, otherwise you get a newton, okay? So that's your total external uh, force. Then we're looking for the load per bolt. Uh, we use the capital P, so a little bit confusing here because we use a P for pressure, and then uh, we have used the P as the external load, right? So, but anyway, so then capital P is the F total divided by the 10 number of bots. Okay, so that's your extra load per bot. So this number divided by 10 and you can calculate that so give us a 10.6 kilo newton. Okay, so extra load per bot is 10.6 kilo newton. So good? Okay, so now we're ready to go through the three different steps as I said, right? So three different uh, process uh, so step one, uh, we can see that uh, we're looking for bot stiffness. Okay, it's bot stiffness. So for bot stiffness, um, very detailed process, as we did in the class example, you need to use the table A-7 to go through the steps, right? To go through the steps actually means uh, you need to figure out what is the proper length, total length for the bot. Because the question didn't tell you that, only tells you what kind of bolt you're using and also the major diameter. So y from the table E-7, you need to figure out this uh, total length capital L. You need to figure out the threaded portion uh, within this member and also the unthreaded portion. Then we calculate the stiffness of unthreaded portion and threaded portion. Then we get the stiffness of the bolt, right? Yeah. So uh, I'll just skip that part and then you can um look at that uh, the assignments okay okay so basically this is a formula for the stiffness of the bot right 
Okay. You need the area of tensile stress area. You need the area of the major diameter portion. You need the threaded portion within the member. Uh, you need the unthreaded portion, right? Uh, within the member, so then you can calculate. E is the stiffness for the steel. Okay, this bolt is always steel. Okay, so you uh, you'll be able to calculate this one here. So E is 207. So calculate this one, you get 539 mega newton per meter. Okay, that's bolt stiffness. And step two. Uh, in the assignments I posted, uh, there is an Excel which I don't need you to basically submit anything, but I think uh, you can use that assign you can use the Excel to facilitate the calculation of uh, uh, the calculation of the bolt and the member stiffness. Okay, so uh, basically all you need to do is just to change a couple parameters based on the given bot that you're looking at, okay? Uh, there is a pretty automated process here, okay, to give you the fastener stiffness, okay? There are two uh, series inch and in the, in the metric, okay? Yeah, for the bot. And uh, I think there should be a member. I'm sure you remember, is there a member here? There's only, there's only bot? Remember, where is it? Anyway, so take a look at it, okay? Yeah. So, member stiffness. Uh, member stiffness we call the KM, okay? So, in this particular question, uh, also you read the question carefully, okay? It didn't see anything about there's an existing washer or not, so there are basically only two members at here, right? And it happened to have uh, the same, what, uh, thickness. So there's no washer. But some question, I'll probably see there's a washer underneath the uh, bolt head. Or there's a washer uh, between the nut and uh, the cast iron, for example, right? Yeah. So if that kind of sentence there, then you need to take that uh, into consideration. Just for the length, right? Pardon me? Just for the length. Yeah, for the length, yes, because that are going to change the stif stiffness of the uh, of the bolt, right? Yeah, that's also also going to change the stiffness of the member. Yeah, because uh, if you recall from previous lecture, so what do you do? You draw out all the members, right, uh, within the clamped joint. If there is a washer, you draw the washer basically as a, as another layer at right here. Okay. Yeah. So for this one here, you have basically two layers, okay, or two, uh, two, uh, two layers of uh, material, and each one of them has the same s thickness. Okay. So if you recall, how do I find the member stiffness again? I draw it out, and then I start to draw a pressure cone. Uh, it's a symmetric pressure cone. So the starting point of the pressure cone is right at the washer f uh, face, right, underneath, or basically wherever we started, underneath the bolt head. So you draw all the way to the other end. It's a symmetric. So the reason why the center of this symmet uh, symmetric line is right at the center because the th th uh, thickness is the same thing at here, right? Yeah. So. Then you look at how many layers do we, how many thrust, and basically how many thrust that we have for under uh, this pressure cone. So there are only two, right? Because there's there are only two trapezoid, and uh, well, there's only tr one trapezoid because the two trapezoid is actually the same shape, but because they're different to material, so that's why we said there are two, right? Yeah. And your your formula for calculating uh, the stiffness for an arbitrary uh, trapezoid of thrust is this guy here. OK. 
Okay, that's your general formula. So capital D is the uh, shorter length of the trapezoid, the top of the trapezoid. Small d is the major diameter of the bot. Okay, that's your general formula. So you coming back to this one here. There are two layers, and each layer share the same uh, same uh, configuration or geometry. Basically, the capital D and the small d is the same thing, right? And what's the capital D in this case? Capital D is this, yeah, basically the top portion here. And the top portion, if you recall that, it started with a length of how much? DW, right? Yeah. And DW equal to 1.5D, exactly. Yeah. So basically your capital D is 1.5D at here, right? So you apply this formula twice. For the first time, your K1, let's say the top one is steel, so you get the steel here. So you use that E is for steel, right? And everything else is the same thing, okay? Then you apply the formula another time for the cost R, okay? So you, all you need to change is change that E to cost R, okay? Yeah. Uh, for the question, if the question didn't give you the stiffness, okay, you should look for, I think, appendix A-2, if I remember correctly, okay? Yeah, it lists the stiffness for different kind of metals. So, you get the two stiffness, right? Let's see, in, in this question, I will get uh, the K steel equal to 4470 mega newton per meter. And cast iron, I got the two one six zero mega newton per meter. Okay, yeah. The two stiffness are connecting series. And then the total stiffness, which is the member stiffness, okay, is equal to one over one over k steel plus one over k cast iron. So that gives us one four five six mega newton per meter. Okay. So once you get the two major steps done, and then the, the next step actually is easier because that's the part you calculate the load factor now. And all you need to do is basically use the formula now, right? Yeah. So load factor. Okay. First load. First factor we're looking for is. Uh, the load factor. So that's NL. The formula is SP times AT minus FI over CP. Okay, that's the formula. So what are the parameters, each one of the one here? SP is called the proof strength. FI is called the preload. And AT is the tensile stress area. Capital P is the, uh, the, the total external load. And the C is the proportion basically uh, taken by uh, the bot. So uh, what, what we don't have at this, uh, at this stage here, right? We, have, uh, we actually don't have any of them. So the C is KB over KB plus KM. So it's based on your calculation of KB and KM. So this one is 0 0.27, okay? I guess what we have is a capital P. And AT is a tensile stress area. Uh, tensile stress area, because the bot is given. The bot is, uh, uh, you use a table E dash, uh, E dash what? E dash two, I think. Yeah, table A-1 is the metric series. So this is from table A-1, okay? Because the major diameter is 12, okay? The major diameter is 12. Uh, I guess it should be specific to see whether it's a coarse series or fine series. Let's say uh, we're dealing with a coarse, okay? So let's put on one more condition in here. 
course. Okay. If you look at our table A-1, what's AT? Eighty-four point three. Okay, yeah. And your S P value is the proof strength, and that has to be from your I S O five point eight grade uh, bot. So this is the table A dash eleven. Okay, it's the metric one. So I'll show you table A dash eleven, which is this guy here. So 5.8 is right here. This column gives us a proof strength. So that's 380 megapound. Okay, 380 megapound. So, all right, yeah. Fi is the preload. So how do we calculate Fi? That based on which keywords? Non-permanent joint, right? Non-permanent joint. For non-permanent joints, what's the suggested uh, value for Fi? It's 0.75 times AT times SP. Okay. So you plug all the number. You have AT. You have SP. Plug this number. Your SFI will be uh, 20. So. Uh, the way I calculate is this. Basically, I have 0 0.75, uh, the 84.3, keep the millimeter, and <coughs> SP, keep 300, uh, 380 megapa. And then the, the outcome here is going to be a Newton. And then, then I divide it by 1,000, and then we get uh, 24 okay, kilo Newton. OK? Yeah. So, so now you have basically all the values over here now. Then you plug it in, you calculate the NL. Okay? Yeah. So capital P is the external load per bolt, and that's a 10.6, right? Yeah. So your NL can be calculated, which is 2.89. Okay. Is that good? Yeah. So that's one safety factor. And the second safety factor is the factor against the separation. And not, and that the formula for this one is F I over P one minus C. So this is pretty simple. This end up with a three point one. Okay, three point one. Okay, yeah. And actually, there's another one is the yielding factor, right? So the yielding factor is basically the S P over the sigma. Okay, yeah. So you can try that on your own. Any questions? So that's the typical question that uh, I will test you in the uh, final exam. Okay. So you need to know how do you calculate the ball stiffness. You need to know how to calculate the member stiffness, and you need to know how to apply uh, the f the formula for uh, for the factor safety factors. Okay. So second, uh, the other topic uh, here. Uh, this is static loading, okay? So uh, the other one is a fatigue loading, okay, of a tension joint. Okay, so this one you should relax. I'm not going to test you actually, okay? But uh, um, <laughs> maybe I should. <laughs> no, uh, but I think it's important that you know, okay? Yeah. So fatigue loading basically means your uh, pressure okay, from the in inside is not a static or constant anymore. It's a, it's a time changing or fluctuating quantity, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So basically that capital P will change between a minimum value and a maximum value, okay? Yeah. So typically, uh, because it's a tension joint, uh, the pressure, internal pressure, right? Uh, the internal pressure, so the P <coughs> mean, okay, uh, generally would not be less than zero, okay? Yeah. 
But anyway, we'll keep it as a uh, as a, a generic formula here. So if this guy is changing at here, then if I look at the the the, the resultant force or resultant mm -hmm. load on the bot, then it's going to change, right? Mm -hmm. Fluctuate too. It's going to fluctuate between uh, the P mean, right, and F I again because of that. So your F B max, F B mean and F B max would be this quantity now. Okay, would be this quantity. So you have a uh, fluctuating quantity for the resultant load, right? This is the resultant load, okay, on um, the board, okay, yeah. Then, uh, we c if we calculate the stress, then would ha we would have an alternating stress and a mean stress. So the alternating stress is Fb max minus Fb mean over 2, right, and then divided by the tensile stress area. So this quantity here give us this C P max minus P mean over two A T. Similarly for the mean stress, it's F B max plus F B mean okay, over two divided by A T. So this one give us C P max plus P mean over 2AT and plus FI over AT. Okay, yeah. Okay, so that's a sigma A and a sigma M. So if you recall that for fatigue loading, once you figure out sigma A and sigma M, and then you're, you're supposed to apply basically their different uh, uh, fatigue criteria, right? There's modified Goodman, the ASME elliptic, elliptic uh, and then the, uh, Soderberg, you know, and all different kind of criteria you can apply now. Uh, but in order to apply that, so let me just probably uh, use the idea of the modified Goodman here to show you why, how you would apply here. Let's say uh, this is basically sigma A axis, sigma M axis. Modified Goodman line is uh, this line over here, right? this line here. And this is SE, this is SUT. Okay, that's modified Goodman. And then your uh, sigma A, sigma M, maybe is calculated, it's right here, right? Maybe this is your sigma A and sigma M. This is your current state of stress. Okay, yeah. So, uh, in order to apply the fatigue loading, as in the chapter that we learned, so what do we do? What we do this is do this, right? We connect the origin then we draw a line, okay, which is what we call the load line, right? Then the load line will intersect this uh, uh, modified Goodman, okay? Yeah. Then the safety factor is basically it's this it's this quantity divided by this quantity here, right? Yeah. That's what we learned in that chapter, okay? Yeah. Now, for this load line, your uh, your uh, slope is sigma A over sigma M. But for the uh, pressure, for the tension joint, the thing is slightly different, okay? The difference is because uh, the bot has an initial load, Fi. So basically, you see the sigma M, right? The mean value has this quantity here. That quantity is not zero, because why? Because your Fi is not zero. Right? So which means what? Your sigma amp is not going to start from here. Right? So it actually, your sigma amp starts somewhere maybe over here. So basically, your starting point, right? Your sigma A and sigma M starting point is really is a zero and Fi over At. That's your starting point. Okay? Yeah. So let's say this is Fi over At. Okay? This is your starting point. If this is the starting point, then in terms of the 
low the line, right? We draw the low line here. We're not going to draw this low line anymore. So we start. We will still start from here. We draw our low the line like this. So from the start point and pass through that current state of stress, and then it intersect the failure criteria critical condition at a certain point. That makes sense. Yeah. Then the safety factor will be this quantity divided by here to here. Okay, same idea. All right. Yeah. Now using geometry, you can find that. Uh, so I'll write this one over here. Okay. Using geometry, you can find like this. Okay. So. Um, Suppose this is this is the intersection point. Then the intersection point has a coordinate of S A S no S has S M S A value. Okay? The intersection point has a coordinate S M and S A value. So what is S A? S A is over here and S M is over here. Right? And this is a sigma A and this is a sigma M. Okay? So you see if I'm looking for the safety factor, if the safety factor, let's see if this is A, B, C, safety factor A, C over A, B, then using the triangle here, it's actually equivalent to what? S, A over sigma A, right? So S, A over sigma A. So safety factor basically N equal to S, A over sigma A, or S, M over sigma M, the same thing. Okay, yeah. So all I need to do is to figure out what is the S A value, right? That sh that should be fine. Well, the S A value, S M value, is the intersection between two lines. One is this line, and the other is this line, right? So you actually you can create the the equation for the two lines easily because why? For the red line here, which is the load line, it passes through two points. One is the initial point here, which is this. Okay, and the other is the current state of stress, which is you calculate it, right? So two points determining a line. S M uh, this one here, this is the modified Goodman line, and the modified Goodman line we already had it, right? So the basically the Goodman line is S A equal to S E Uh, maybe I should use sigma a, but anyway, yeah, it's fine. It's this, okay? Yeah, it's this line here. Yeah. So basically, if you recall, that is sigma a over s e plus sigma m over s u t equal to one, right? That's your uh, modified Goodman. So I'm changing sigma a sigma m to s a s e because that's the point on the line there, okay? On the point on the line. So you solve two line equation, right? Then you can obtain the S A value. So you'll get your S A, okay, which equal to, okay, uh, well, this is a little bigger expression over here. Okay, that's your S A. Then your safety factor is basically fatigue safety factor S A. Okay, over sigma A. Okay, yeah. Sigma I is this F I over A T. Okay, yeah. So this is basically uh, the typical process you would do for uh, fatigue loading of a tension joints. Okay, yeah, so not too bad actually. Okay. Uh, you can consider a very special case, right? You can consider a special case, uh, which is actually typically probably true. Uh, the pressure inside the pressure vessel, let's say, is P mean is zero, and then P max, okay, is a certain value, capital P. Okay, yeah. Then uh, you can substitute these two 
back into the formulas that we just listed here, and you can get uh, basically a specific safety factor corresponding to this situation. Okay. Yeah. Well, all right. Yeah. So there's one little thing. Okay. One, just one last little thing now. Is basically the formula that we use at here didn't consider fatigue, stress, concentration. So you might have, you might want to consider stress concentration in terms of the bolt. And uh, so basically, the formula will be Kf over Se plus Kf sigma over Sut, like these kind of things, right? Yeah. So how do I get the Kf then? Uh, you don't need to calculate, uh, you know, those uh, notch sensitivities and stuff like that. So what you need to do basically, you need to use this table uh, A-17, which is this one, okay? So A-17 give you uh, in hmm? What's going on? Oh, sorry. Yeah, you need to use the A. Hmm? Oh, I see. Yeah. So you don't need to calculate the Kf. What you need, what you do is you basically the Se value. Okay. You get it from this table A-17. And the SE value, if you look at that uh, bottom line here, it's uh, fully corrected for uh, the, f the fatigue stress concentration. So SE is already calculated. Basically, uh, the SE here is basically like this. It's corrected by this KF already from the table. Okay? Yeah. So the last column here is the SE value, right? So you can basically replace this SE okay, with the value from the table A-17 to account for fatigue stress concentration. Okay? Yeah. So table A-17. Okay? Yeah. So that should wrap up this tension joint safety analysis. Okay? So remember what I just said about uh, uh, what you need to uh, need to know, alright? So you have a little bit of time here, so I'm going to go over a uh, little bit of introduction to welded joints. Okay. So you can uh, relax a little bit here. Okay, uh, introduction to welded joints. Okay, uh, the uh, objective is actually again. This is how you, you need to be careful here. You need to be able to read the very basic welding symbol. Okay, because uh, the question that I give you on the welded joint, or I give you is probably just a symbol pointing to the welded joints. You need to grab the useful information out of it and use for your calculation. Okay, yeah. So that's. Uh, my requirements for this one here. So here's a tree that we have uh, sh shown uh, quite a few times. So right now we are sitting uh, at this portion, right? Just like the fasteners, okay? Uh, but the a welded joint is a permanent joint, okay? Not like a fasteners, uh, it's non-permanent. Three concepts, welds, joints, and weldment. So weld means it's a zone of a metal that joins, okay? joins two or more components created by localized melting, mixing, and a cooling of metal from the parent components and an expendable feeder material. And the expendable feeder material needs to be compatible composition as the base metal or the parent metal. Okay? Yeah. The melting is done uh, using a, heat, a certain heat source. Basically, uh, it could be an electric arc, so very high voltage, okay? or an oxy a, a acetylene a flame. Okay? Yeah. Uh, joints, essentially, I'll show you, basically refer to uh, what type, how you weld the two things together. You know, there's a butt weld, 
there's a spot weld, there is a T joint, uh, you know, basically that kind of idea, okay? Yeah. And weldment referred to the, the structure, you know, if it's a, s a steel structure welded together, right, that's basically re we refer to as a weldment, okay? A uh, very typical example you see in the civil uh, s uh, steel structures, uh, you, you, you weld t t uh, this kind of a T-joint, right? A T-bars, you know, basically together. And you can weld it at here and here using this uh, fillet weld, right? Yeah. And in a digging machine, and that's, you, can, you see an evidence of a welds uh, at uh, many, many different places, right? And they are basically, uh, they are all uh, become a, uh, permanent joints. A welding process, okay, uh, there are two commonly used process, okay, uh, de depends on how you look at it, but anyway, basically there's a consumable electrical methods and there's non-consumable electrical methods, but either way is you're using a welding power, you know, supplied to create an electrical art, okay, uh, between the electrical and the base material. Then the electrical will be melt, okay, at the, with the welding uh, points, okay, yeah. So for consumable electrode, okay, a typical one you see is a shield metal arc welding, or uh, simply we call it a stick weld. Okay, you see the guys holding a stick, right? Yeah. Uh, or gas metal arc welding. So gas metal arc welding is that you have a consumable electrical wire, and then at the same time you're feeding an external, uh, external inner gas, either helium or uh, uh, carbon dioxide, right? Uh, basically to displace uh, the airs from the welding joints, okay? For non-consumable ones, a typical one is gas tungsten arc weld. So uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, the electric arc is generated between uh, tungsten and, uh, and the, the base metal. And then you have a, a filler material, okay? Yeah. So uh, here's uh, some uh, typical pictures uh, regarding the stick weld, okay? It comes about a 50% of all industrial industrial welding, okay? And I have a better picture in the next one there, okay? So the, the stick has a cover, a layer of a so-called flux, okay, on the outside of the electrode. So then when, uh, when the uh, electro art is initiated, and then a high temperature will basically liquefy this uh, flux, and then the, the liquefied flux will flow onto the a uh, welded uh, point here, and then provide a protection, basically it's a slug, a, a slag, okay? Yeah. So uh, when it cool off, uh, you will have to scrape off the slag, okay? So sometimes you probably have to uh, uh, make it more smooth, right? Yeah. A good weld uh, means there is a penetration, uh, you know, basically into the base metal. Okay, basically that's a good weld, right? Yeah, and a good welder actually got paid very well, you know. Uh, it, uh, the, there was one time I was visiting uh, Okanagan College. Uh, they have a, a pretty neat, actually, a, a computer animated uh, welding machine, basically. It's not really well. You, you put on the goggle and uh, you, you see, basically, and then you press this button and you're basically animating the, pro uh, the welding process. And, th and within the goggle, it has some indication shows uh, good wells, you know, and then uh, not good. You know, basically, yeah, it tells you the status of uh, your skill, basically, right? It takes sort of probably less than five minutes, you, you will become a pretty experienced one. So, <laughs> about that scheme, though, right? Yeah. Uh, stick weld is actually pretty general because uh, you can use it uh, indoor and outdoor. Uh, so even if there's wind. And then you can still use that, right? Not as uh, the last one there and uh, this one here. Uh, this is a gas metal arc weld. So there is a wire, basically consumable electrodes fitting here. And then you have the inner gas also coming here, right? Yeah. Uh, the inner gas is essentially argon or carbon dioxide, helium or helium, and it's displaced air, you know, um, out of the welded joints here, okay, to prevent oxidation. But uh, uh, this is not recommended uh, for outdoor with the wind speed uh, uh, above, let's say, five uh, mile per hour, uh, that kind of situation, okay? Yeah. So 
Uh, it's the same basic picture as the previous one. Uh, gas tungsten arc weld. So you have uh, uh, this GTAW head, and there's this tungsten electrode that's right here, right? And then you have a filler a rod or materials like that. Okay. So and then uh, there's some uh, a certain amount of uh, 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 gas, right? Shielding gas. Okay. So uh, generally, this produces a pretty smooth surface, right? And it's used for non-ferrous material. So type of wells, okay? You can have a fillet type, okay? You can have a, a bead, okay? So like this is the bead here, okay? You can have a plug, okay? So plug basically the electrode uh, put on the sandwich of the metal, and then you have a pa let the current electrical current pass through this uh, sandwich's metal at that right point. Then the high temperature basically will stick the two at there. It's very common in saying in automobile industry. And they usually do that to using uh, a robotic manipulator, right? If you visit uh, a Windsor or somewhere, well, actually they all gone now. Um, you see all the robotic. It's very actually amazing, you know. It's this, it's, it's just uh, industry is not doing very well. Uh, groove, uh, groove type of uh, uh, welds, right? So there's a V type, a double V, or this kind of V. A bevel, okay, or U or J, right? Mm -hmm. And this is plug, a plug, and this is a spot. Sorry, I was actually I talking a spot here. This is this, um, you know, the passing through the current. So I'm talking spot welds, okay? Yeah, not the plug weld. Uh, type of a joint. So that's what I'm saying there. So you have a butt, corner, a T, or lap, or edge, right? So there's different ways you can put the two things together, okay? Uh, there's a better picture here. It's a butt fillet or flange joint, the corner here. Okay, yeah. Okay, so this is what I need your attention here. Well, specification. So how do we read the symbols here? Okay, yeah. Um, what you typically see is you you see an arrow, and then pointing to a certain location, right? So the arrow has upside and then downside. Basically, there's top side and the bottom side here. You probably will see certain symbols on the top or the bottom here, but when you see the things at the bottom, so basically that the symbol at the bottom refer to the arrow side. The symbol on the yeah, the symbol on the top refer to the opposite side. Okay, yeah. So you'll see. I'll show you a couple of symbols basically. And this circle right here refer to all around, okay? Yeah. So it's all about how we properly read the symbols here, okay? So I'll show you a couple of, a couple of things. So those are the symbols you probably will see uh, at this location or this location. So these symbols basically indicate what type of weld you're dealing with. Are you dealing with V or bevel or U or J or fillet, right? These kind of things, okay? So fillet is our focus. We will look at the fillet. We'll look at the design of a welded joint for fillet uh, welds. So, like, say, for example, you have this one here. So, technically, so that symbol, right, is right here. Okay. So, what does that mean? So, basically, that means you have a both sides, huh? Fillet welds, and uh, both sides are symmetric. And the five right here is a size, as we're going to learn. Five is the H, is the throat area. Okay. <coughs> oh, sorry, actually, this is five here. Okay? Okay? So, and this one here, it's a cylinder. So, the circle means it's welded all around here. Okay? With a leg size of five. It's called a leg size. And this one here, you see, uh, it's, a, it's a weld with a certain frequencies, right? And there's a pitch uh, between two adjacent welds. So, the symbol is looking like this 60 refer to the length, and 200 refer to the pitch. So let's see, uh, this, for this example, this is basically, um, I could very well give you a an, an, uh, multiple choice. So you see there's 75, 125. So then uh, the way we use uh, the welding is for this one here is, right? So 125 for, yeah, when you look at this, when you look at the symbol here, which side is 125? Tell me. The up or the, the bottom? Bottom, right? Yeah. The arrow side is 75, okay? Yeah. And this one here means a symmetric distribution on both sides. And this one here is asymmetric, 
It's alternating, right? Okay. Yeah. Uh, different other ones we probably won't use, but you can see the symbols for bevel is this guy. It also tells you the angle. Uh, it also tells you symmetric one. Okay, this one here is the V type. Okay, this one's double V, right? Okay, so this is basically what you will see on the uh, on the drawing ta on the drawing uh, this uh, plot, right? The plot of this uh, here G, okay, U, okay, so different ones here. So this is the typical weld drawing here. You can see different uh, uh, symbols for the welds. Okay. So anyway, uh, take a look at this one here. My requirement is to be able to tell from the fillet welds. What's the leg size? What's the type of welds? Okay. Any questions? Okay.